has to get in the zone, you know. Well, howdy, 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 and welcome to the Real Faith Live Show. While the world is getting darker, Real Faith is getting a little hotter and a little brighter. Welcome to the 100th episode of the Real Faith Live Show! Pastor Landon here coming at you live from Trinity Church in Scottsdale, Arizona. Guys, we're so glad you're joining us on the Real Faith Live show today. Uh, it's a little less live than normal. I'm here at Trinity's seventh birthday. It is an absolute party, guys. We have a full-blown park that just got built in front of the church. There is a giant taco burger truck behind you that you won't see because I'm staring at it and I'm getting a little hungry. We are so glad you're joining and tuning in with over a million people every single week on the Real Faith Live show, guys. We're, we just kicked off First Thessalonians here at Trinity. Uh, you guys are like three or four weeks into First Thessalonians, an end time survival guide. Guys, it's been an epic series so far. We're loving it. It's absolutely amazing. Online is going great. Even though some of the platforms are trying to kick us off, we're doing our best to stay on with you guys. So uh, drop a comment where you're tuning in from. We'd love to hear to, uh, to just know where the platforms are allowing us to broadcast too because uh, it's pretty crazy. They kicked us off Facebook the other day and uh, we stopped being recommended to anyone, which is awesome. Uh, so we're kind of trying to punch out of our weight class right now with uh, all the crazy uh, Facebook demons right now. Guys, uh, I was just telling you earlier about the incredible birthday party happening here at Trinity Church. Um, little did you know that this church was planted because of your generous giving over seven years ago. We had supporters like you that helped fund this church plant when it was just a baby, baby church. And uh, look at it now, guys. We had over 3,000 people here this weekend hearing about Bible teaching, having a lot of fun, and uh, just growing in community. Guys, we're just so thankful that you are joining us online right now. All of you guys out there partnering with us in prayer and in financial giving. Guys, when you jump on realfaith.com and you give a gift of any amount, it helps us so much do incredible ministry like what's happening behind me, people meeting Jesus. But even more than that, this year alone, 300 million people have heard about Jesus because of your support. And guys, we have a team that's growing really quick because we're trying to keep up with all the incredible social media growth that's happening. Um, the live streams are bigger than ever. The YouTube's bigger than ever. Our Instagram's bigger than ever. And believe it or not, our TikTok's bigger than ever. Guys, we need your support. And if you give a gift at realfaith.com slash partner this month, we will send you the First Thessalonians Study Guide. We'll send you a study guide on how to survive the end times. If you don't need to know how to survive the end times, don't worry about it, don't give. You can die, you won't be raptured a second time, contrary to popular opinion. You've got one shot at this. So, if you wanna be um, taken up to meet the Lord the right way, you can order the End Times Survival Guide by giving it your gift of any amount at realfaith.com slash partner. Thanks guys, we're so thankful for your support and your partnership. Well guys, it's the time you've all waited for. Pastor Mark isn't getting up right now to preach, but right now in your world, he is getting up to preach in your time. It's like I'm a time traveler. Get ready, this sermon's gonna be awesome. Yeehaw. All right, we're in a great book of the Bible called First Thessalonians. If you've got a Bible, feel free to uh, find chapter form. Before we jump in, two quick things. Uh, one, 
um, we're gonna dig into God's word and I really wanna narrow your focus today. And I believe that's what the scriptures do. Look at your life. If you're married, your marriage. If you're a parent, look at your family. Because what can happen is we wake up, we turn on our phone and we are drug into global political intrigue, national head-on collisions, things that we have no control or authority over. And the result is you can spend your whole time and rather waste rather than invest all of your time on it and energy on things that really are out of your control and you're gonna overlook the things that are in your control that can make your life better, your marriage better, your family better, amen? I'll give you an example. So this week, I'll give you two examples. Um, turn, so uh, jobs report, not great. Interest rates are going up again. We're into inflation. Okay, great. What can I do about that? Nothing. I don't oversee inflation. And today, turn on the TV, snuggling with bed and grace, boom, Israel's invaded again. It's like the 737,000th time in the history of the world that someone has attacked the nation of Israel. The Bible says, pray for the peace and prosperity of Israel. So we will. And true or false, it's just totally very, very frustrating. It's not political. This is just me venting since it's just us girls hanging out for a little bit. But it's like, oh, so all of a sudden it's like Abraham slept with two women. And so now we still have two groups of people in the Middle East that are fighting over a piece of dirt. This is what happens when you don't keep your pants on. We're gonna get to that in chapter four in just a minute. A lot of you are like, what? It's just two girls. Like, well, we now have Hamas in Israel. And basically it's because he had two women and that's too many, okay? It's very simple. What's, what is a geopolitical problem started out as an underwear issue? That's what I'm telling you. And so we're gonna talk about this in chapter four of 1 Thessalonians. It's like, okay, well, the Hamas terrorist group invades, attacks Israel. Now Israel needs to respond. Thankfully, the US has some strategic arms stored in Israel, but those are depleted because we sent them to protect the Ukrainian border while ignoring our own. Okay, yes, we're, the world is run by a cabal of drunk monkeys. That's what I'm telling you, okay? And so you could just look at the world and just be so frustrated. Or you can just try to figure out, okay, God, what do you have for me? How can I enjoy my life? The people and things that I have responsibility for, how can I actually create an environment in which they're healthy and flourishing, amen? So let's just flush all of that and focus on this, you and God and those people that God has put closest to you. Number two, these are just the announcements and then we'll get into the Bible and then the offensive parts. And if you're still with us, we'll close in prayer. That's where we're going. Um, and so let me give you a free gift because what we're gonna talk about today is, is sex and sexuality. It's in 1 Thessalonians 4. Uh, but again, I wanna give you a free book. And so this is a book that I wrote with my wife, Grace. They'll put the QR code up. Real Romance, uh, Sex in the Song of Songs. And as we get into this subject, I can't cover everything, but the book covers a lot. If you're single, like if you're really single, don't read it yet. Like wait until you have somebody who thinks you're interesting and, and maybe in a serious relationship. Otherwise, it'll just be frustrating. If you are uh, engaged, this would be a great book. If you're married, this would be a really great book. And if you disagree with what I teach today, you need to read it twice. Okay, so uh, that's a free gift and I'll give it to you if, you, uh, if you'd like it. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna pray. We're gonna get into 1 Thessalonians 4. We're gonna focus on God's word and the people and things that we have the ability to influence. God, I pray against distraction. God, I pray against uh, oppression. I, I pray against all of the forces that want us to, to not look up to you and look into our own heart and life and look into your word to figure out what you would have for us in this season of life. Holy Spirit, we invite you as our sacred guest to help us learn the scriptures which you inspired to be written so that we could have a life that we enjoy. God, regardless of what is going on in the world around us, we invite the Holy Spirit to bring life and peace and joy and hope in us as we open your word in Jesus' good name, amen. All right, today's subject, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 12, more holiness, less naughtiness. And I'll start with a, a, a story. So I've been a pastor for about 30 years and I started in uh, college ministry with young college age kids, single adults, punk rockers, homeless street kids, and I wanted to start a Bible study. So I rented a room at a Baptist church from a bunch of old grandmas. And, uh, and, and then I invited all these punk rock kids and college kids to come. And uh, the punk rock kids and the homeless street kids, they said, they, here was their question like, can we smoke at the Bible study? Can we smoke at the Bible? I was like, I've never seen a smoking section at a Bible study. I, I don't think if I go to the elderly grandmas at the Baptist church, this is going to get a positive vote. Yes, we like cigarettes in our Baptist church. 
And so, um, so I, I told him, I said, well, are, do, would you guys actually come if I had a smoking section for the Bible study? Because right now you guys don't know Jesus and you don't know this, but like you're in the smoking section. We gotta fix this and get you to the Bible study and talk to you about Jesus. So they're like, yeah, hey, we'll come to the Bible study if we could smoke. So I found a public park and I decided we do the Bible study at the public park. And I was gonna teach on Revelation because I thought what else would punk rock homeless college kids want than Revelation? I mean, you know, it's most of their bands are singing it anyways. And so, so I, I, I opened, I was like, hey guys, we're in Revelation. So uh, I'm like in my early twenties and they're just a little younger than me. And I start teaching and some of the punk rock kids, they interrupt me while smoking. They're like, hey, we don't wanna talk about this. I was like, well, what do you wanna talk about? And they're like, we don't wanna talk about this. I was like, okay, what do you wanna talk about? They're like, we wanna do Q and A. I was like, hey man, I prepped all week, you know? And I already got you a smoking section. Like, I feel like, I feel like we need to meet in the middle. They're like, no, we have questions. I was like, okay. So they start asking their questions and there's two kinds of kids there. There's kids that grew up in the Christian homes. And these kids are like very, my wife's chuckling cause she was there. Like these are the kids. They're like part in their hair and you know, and then there's these other kids, you know, they got guy liner on and painted fingernails and this was in the grunge era. And so they start asking their questions and they're all sexual, very specific. Like, like, like I, I went to public school and there was stuff I was like, I'm not sure what that means. Like I would, it, this was very specific. <laughs> and all of a sudden the kids that grew up in the Christian homes and the Christian schools like, they're not making eye contact with me and they're getting really red and they're blushing and they feel very uncomfortable. And, and the punk rock kids are like, yeah, good question. And so I'm, I'm trying to answer these questions at the public park while the kids are smoking. And after a while, I think, okay, they're joking with me. This is just make the pastor blush moment. I was like, hey guys, can we get back to the Bible study? They're like, no, 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 we, these are real questions. I was like, okay, we've been doing this for a long time, like half hour. And all we've done so far is just, you know, basically the, the weirdest counseling section I've ever had with perverted people in my whole life. I was like, do you guys have any other questions? They're like, yeah, aliens and dinosaurs and can we smoke weed? So let me just say this, here's what I've learned. Lost people, if you really wanna reach them, do a series on uh, aliens uh, smoking weed, riding dinosaurs while being intimate. That would be like the blow away series because those are the only things they care about. And so, uh, so I got done finally with the Bible study and it was the weirdest Bible study of all time. And then all the Christian kids, they went over to play volleyball. <laughs> they brought a net and a volleyball and they're like, let's go play volleyball. And all the punk rock kids were over talking about how much they hated their parents. And so they were all smoking. So I went and hung out with the punk rock kids and, uh, and I realized these were genuine real questions. Okay, and then I go over to the, to the Christian kids who are playing volleyball, trying to just recover from this trauma. And, um, <laughs> And they looked at me, they're like, that was a weird Bible study. I was like, yeah, it was really weird. And uh, I looked at a couple of the guys, I was like, did you honestly understand all the questions? He was like, honestly, I didn't know half the stuff they were asking. He's like, I'm still a virgin, you know? And so I was like, okay, so, so here's the big idea. What happens is if you grow up in a religious environment, church, home, Bible teaching, there's certain questions regarding sex and gender, they're answered. You're like, well, doesn't everybody know that? And then you meet some people that didn't grow up in the church, never seen a Bible, they were raised by wolves. And you're like, these people, they have totally different questions. And so what happens in the Bible, it starts with the Jewish people loving Jesus. That's where it starts. The Bible says to the Jew first, then the Gentile, which is the non-Jew. So if you see the Jews, fall in love with Jesus, they've got the Old Testament. Like, yeah, we don't have sex before marriage. There is a boy and a girl. Marriage is for one guy and one girl and you don't commit adultery. Otherwise people throw rocks at you. You know, there's certain, there's certain things that are established. As soon as it jumps to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews, you gotta start at zero. And that's what happens in Thessalonians. All of this is truly a setup for an amazing potential sermon. We'll see how it goes in the next hour or two. So the way it works is Paul goes in Acts 17. Uh, he preaches at a synagogue to a bunch of Jewish people. They fall in love with Jesus. The church gets started. And then the Gentiles start showing up and they do the exact same thing as the punk rock kids at my Bible study. They're like, we got questions. So they write Paul a letter with all their questions. And then Paul writes 1 Thessalonians to answer their questions. These are not questions that the religious people that grew up with the Old Testament would have. They're like, I can't believe you're asking that question. Like, we're new, we're new. Now, 
The context of 1 Thessalonians 4 is the ancient Roman Empire, and it's run by Greek language and culture. So let me just ask you this. Um, was the Roman Empire and Greek culture naughty and perverted? Yes. Completely. Completely. It looked just like America. Just like America, right? So like there's this thing trending online. People are like, oh, does your boyfriend think about the Roman Empire? It's like, well, your boyfriend is the Roman Empire. Um, he's naughty. So anyways, um, in the Roman Empire, they thought that the, the most fulfilling sexual intimacy was between an older man and a younger boy. So they were grooming young boys. It was a grooming predatorial culture. They had polygamy, they had cross-dressing, they had temples with ritual prostitution. One in Corinth had a thousand male and female prostitutes. And so it was exactly like the world in which we live. And let me just say this, the world in which we live knows nothing of God's word when it comes to sexuality. I'll share this with you and then we'll jump in. Here's a recent uh, Gallup poll of morally acceptable behavior. Okay, and if you were homeschooled, hold your chair, right? You're, you're gonna twitch, okay? 72% um, of Americans believe that fornication is moral. This is sex before marriage. This is single people living and sleeping together. And this is not morally neutral, this is morally positive, okay? Now, let me, let's just vote. All of you dads that have a daughter that you love, do you think that this is immoral? One, two, three? Yeah. Yes, okay, so that one's wrong. Okay, how about this one? 64% of Americans believe that a same-sex sexual relationship is moral. 52% believe abortion is moral. 43% believe that teen sex is immoral. 39% believe that pornography is moral. 23% believe polygamy is moral. I bet you none of those guys ask their wives. And 9% think that a marital affair is moral. So our culture is just like the one that Paul is writing to. All of their questions are already well established, but they don't know. So here we go. How to stop a wildfire. First Thessalonians 4, 1, 3. Did you enjoy the introduction? Okay, okay, and, and if you're like, no. Okay, it's gonna get worse. First Thessalonians 4, 1 through 8. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus. So these are for believers, believers in the Lord Jesus, uh, that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you were doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instruction we gave you through the Lord Jesus. That's a massive statement. He says, what we taught, is what Jesus wanted us to teach. We speak on his behalf. For this is the will of God. Here it is, your sanctification. We'll talk about that. That you abstain from sexual immorality. That's the issue, that's the theme. That each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust, like the punk rockers who don't know God. Okay, that's what Gentiles means. These are the pagans that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, especially if you both say you're Christians, you better keep your hands to yourself because the Lord is an avenger in all these things as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for impurity, but for holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. This is an authoritative directive. And what he's saying is, hey guys, here's the first thing. If you don't control your sexuality, you're going to self-destruct. And he hits three issues that are absolutely crucial in our day. The first is authority. And that is, where is the authority over our body and our life and our gender and our sexuality? Okay, there's a book written by Carl Truman. It's called uh, Strange New World. And it's a summary of a bigger book that he wrote. And just to summarize this, what he says is that we are living in the midst of an epochal shift in Western culture. It used to be that authority was external and now it's internal. And it used to be based upon facts. Now it's based upon feelings. So God says that we're male and female. Somebody's like, I don't feel like that. Okay, well, is the fact true or is the feeling true? Is the objective true or is the subjective true? Is the external true or the internal true? And what we're talking about is what ultimately is the center of the universe? Is it God or you? Or is it facts that he declares or feelings that you experience? And so this is a massive and apocal shift. 
And so what you're looking at today, people will deny the external for the internal. They'll deny the facts for the feelings. So in our world, you know, so let me just ask you this. Let's just do this. I just verbal process a lot and it's fun on the internet. So I'm gonna keep doing it. So um, am I a 13 year old Asian girl? It feels judgy. It feels judgy. This is not a safe space. Dude said still no, okay? <laughs> Give me the knuckles, brother. Okay, so now why do you say that? I am I 13? Now, what if I feel like it? You say, okay, well, am I Asian? How do you know? I'm Asian in my heart. I had sushi for lunch. Like I, I you know, am I, probably shouldn't have said that. Am I, am I a girl? How do you know? Maybe I'm just a girl that had a rough late night and you know, I'm, and I, I'm looking a little rough. <laughs> okay. See, you all chuckle cause you're sane, okay? People that aren't sane, they're like, whoa, okay, if that's how you feel, okay? <laughs> right. and, so, and so we live in this weird day where you go to the doctor, you're like, hey, could you cut off certain parts? So that, so that what's external corresponds with what's internal. They'll say, yeah. Well, I don't, I don't feel like I need my left arm. They're like, well, we can't cut that off. Well, why can you cut other things off, but not my left arm? See, this is the problem with reality. At some point you have to deal with it. So wh wh what they were saying is we, we feel like whatever gender or sex or pleasure or sexuality, the Gentiles that don't know God, right? Those punk rock crazies, they're, they're going with their feelings. And he's like, no, no, let's go with the facts. Well, this is how I feel. And it's like, but these aren't facts. These aren't facts. Well, you're, and so, oh, okay, this will be offensive. I'm just verbal processing. And then we'll, we'll keep going in a minute. But um, if what you feel doesn't correspond with reality, you have a mental health problem. Okay, you have a mental health problem. Okay, you have a mental health problem. So we live in a culture where like, well, they have mental health and that's true for them, but it's not true. I'll give you another example. I just feel like talking. So let's say I, let's say I go to the bank and I go to the bank and I'm like, I feel like a millionaire. I feel like it. Like, into, like don't judge my heart. This is how I feel. Okay, what they're gonna go with is the facts. Like you don't have a million dollars. Like I do in my heart and I need it in my account. <laughs> I need what's in here to manifest out there. And they're like, sorry, we don't do that. We do have a security guard that will taser you, but no, you can't have a million dollars, okay? And, and the point is this, at some point you've gotta decide, is there an authority beyond me? Are there facts beyond my feelings? Is there a reality that I need to conform to rather than pretending that I'm God in the center of the universe and everyone and everything needs to conform to me? So he's dealing with authority, he's dealing with identity and is your identity in your sin or your salvation? These people are like, well, I, I think I'm this and I like that and this feels good and here's, here's what I enjoy. It's like, well, that's your identity is established in your sin. And what he wants is your identity established in your salvation. He says, here's God's will for you, sanctification, and he gives you the Holy Spirit. That's what he just said. You've been saved by Jesus, forgiven by your sin, past, present, and future, if you've repented of sin and received Jesus Christ as Lord. Now you have the Holy Spirit. Now you have a new nature. Now you have a new identity. Now you have new desires. Now you have a new power. And sanctification means you're gonna change. You're going to grow. You're not going to be true to yourself. You're going to be true to your savior who changes you and saves you from you. Okay. Um, so then um, you can clap or not clap. I'm doing it either way, um, but I appreciate the affection. So thank you. So he deals with authority, identity, and then sexuality. And what he says is certain things are, he uses this word. It's a big word, immoral, immoral. There's a difference between that which is illegal and that which is immoral. Illegal is in reference to the government. Immoral is in reference to God. God has laws that are higher than the government. That's why the government is often immoral. Just throwing it out there, something to think about. And so what he said, so these people would be saying, well, it's not illegal. And he's like, no, but it's immoral. 
Well, you can't arrest us for it. No, but you can go to hell for it. And so the difference between illegal and immoral is if you're doing something immoral, can you call, let's say you're in a relationship, somebody does something immoral, can you call the cops? Right? <sighs> My boyfriend is looking at porn. Great, we're gonna be there in just a minute. We gotta load our guns first. <laughs> you know, no. They'll be like, well, that's, that's a boyfriend. That's why you should dump him, right? Um, and go to Trinity and find another guy who goes to real men. Okay, uh, so, so, so what he's saying is that the standard for God's people is higher than before they met God. And God doesn't just forgive you, he changes you and he calls you to a higher standard and a better lifestyle. And, and what happens in our world is this, people are just like, but this is what I feel and this is what I like and this is what I enjoy. And, and if it doesn't hurt anybody and it's just me, like what's the big deal? Well, I'll give you, uh, I'll give you an analogy. So the passion of pleasure and intimacy, it's like a fire. And the best place for a fire is in a fireplace or outside in a fire ring, okay? So uh, this week, I actually, actually uh, a couple nights ago, I was up in the mountains, crisp, cool night. I started a fire, but guess what I made sure? It was in a fire ring. Because why? If it's like, well, it's just my little fire, but if I don't tend to my fire, I burn your house down, okay? Uh, I'll give you an example. Here's, a, here's an example of uh, what happens when you don't tend to your fire. This is the Idaho Moose Fire. Um, it was in 2022. And here's what's kind of staggering. It burned 130,235 acres. It cost $100 million. It killed five firefighters. And here's how it started. One guy didn't tend to his fire. That's it. Now, let me just say this, our world really likes sex, but doesn't like to contain the flames of the fire and it's burning everyone and everything down. And if you are going to sin sexually, it doesn't just affect you, it has generational and it has national and sometimes global implications. And so what he's talking about here is that God has a ring. And so when I started my fire last night or two nights ago, I made sure that there was a fire ring. What happens if you start a fire without a fire ring? You don't contain and direct all of the flames and heat. So eventually it just consumes everything. So I put it in a fire ring and let me say this, marriage for God, that's the fire ring. Oh, and marriage is heterosexual. If you're, if you're new, I need to throw that in. So marriage is for a man and a woman, and it's the ring that holds the fire so that it contains the passion and it directs it and it controls it so it doesn't become a wildfire and burn your life down and burn your relationships down and burn your generational legacy down and burn our nation down and burn our culture down, amen? Yeah. And so the Bible is not against sex, but it's for marriage. And so what Paul is telling them is, you, you, you now have the fire outside of the ring. And so everything outside of the ring is a sin. In the ring, in the fire ring, man, woman, married. That's the ring, okay? Literally, the ring. And so everything outside of that, and, and some of you are here and you're hearing this or you're online, you're like, what about this, what about that? It's wrong. What about if we feel different? Back to my first point, you're an idiot. Um, well, what if we prayed about it? Well, Jesus says, no, he told me to tell you. Okay, so you can't get out of it. So here's what he says. You know how to control your body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who don't know God. Once you become a believer in Jesus, you're like, you know what? I'm for marriage and sex is within marriage and anything that I believe or any way that I behave outside of that needs to change because I need to submit to an external authority called God, not an internal authority called how I feel. So there's two issues here. You have two choices, we all do. You can live your life by passion or pleasure and, or purpose. 
Let me just say it again. You can live your life for pleasure or purpose. These are the only two options. Previous to them meeting Jesus and getting this letter, were they living for pleasure or purpose? Pleasure. Most people in our world live for pleasure. That's it. They avoid pain and pursue pleasure. You can't be mature. You can't be healthy. You can't be a parent. You can't be a spouse. You can't be a functional human being unless you're willing to choose purpose over pleasure much of the time. If you're gonna be a parent, it's going to not always be pleasurable. If you're going to be a good spouse making sacrifices, it's not always going to be pleasurable. If you're gonna lead a company or a ministry or take responsibility for a family, it's not always going to be pleasurable. We have created an entire generation of weak, impotent, incompetent pleasure seekers. We've got a whole generation of just young men who are failure to launch, not in the labor force, living at their mother's house, watching porn, vaping, ordering DoorDash, no intention of ever working or marrying or fathering children and making a difference because it feels good. These are the freaking guys at the store that are wearing their pajamas at four o'clock in the afternoon on a Thursday with bedhead because getting up by the crack of dinner is a real stretch. Those guys. And if you're driven by pleasure, you're going to self-destruct your life and you're going to be a joke. And so at some point you've got to determine, I'm gonna live my life not by pleasure, but by purpose. There's a reason why I do what I do and don't do what I don't do. I have a purpose for my life. I have a purpose for my sexuality. I have a purpose for my financial status. I have a purpose for my job. I have a purpose for this dating relationship that we are in. I have a purpose for my children. And that's what he's driving toward. So let me talk about the six purposes of sex and heterosexual marriage. And I'll hit these quick because I've been ranting so much, we're late. Um, But here's the first one, pleasure. Uh, Did you know that? How many of you are like, that's new. Okay, you're a liar in church. Okay, it's, it's pleasure. The Song of Songs, and again, we'll give you the free book. It mentions the passions of marriage, never mentions children. Is it okay if you're a husband and wife just to be together because you enjoy it? Yes, Yes. okay, thank you. Jeez, one honest man. I mean, it's like. (laughs) There's only two kinds of men that don't agree with me, dead men and liars, okay? Here's the second purpose, children, right? Be fruitful and multiply. Is it okay to be together? You're like, hey, we'd like to, we'd like to have kids. Yeah. Okay, whatever, I don't care. So uh, third one, oneness, it says that Adam uh, and Eve, they became one flesh. It, it bonds you together. We'll talk about this practically in a moment. Knowledge, you get to know one another in an intimate and private way. Genesis 4.1, Adam lay with his wife Eve and he knew her. Protection, 1 Corinthians 7, don't deprive one another within the marriage covenant, but by mutual consent for a time and then come together and devote yourself to prayer. Otherwise, Satan will get a foothold. The best defense is a good offense. You'll get that on the way home. Comfort, 2 Samuel 12, 24 gives a case where there's a husband and a wife and a child dies and they're together to comfort one another. As long as one of these six purposes is met within the context of marriage, then it's within the ring that God intends to contain all the fires of passion. Once it's outside of that, you have grave danger. Now, what's really curious is um, brain science is finally catching up with the Bible. What I love about science, eventually it catches up. And what the brain science has determined is that we have pleasure pathways. And literally what happens is we live for um, the sort of biochemical high that comes when we have pleasure. Oftentimes this is the dopamine hit at the front of the brain. But when it comes to one flesh and intimacy, it triggers the pleasure center in the brain that includes dopamine, oxytocin, and vasopressin. The response is similar to like heroin. You really wanna enjoy that again because it's such a pleasurable experience. And so what happens is if you're living for pleasure, but you don't do so with purpose, you literally neurologically hardwire your brain 
to the shortest distance between two points, you and the pleasure. Now, what happens is this becomes almost unconscious. Certain alcoholics, drug addicts, gambling addicks, sex addicts, they, they'll be like, I don't even remember doing that. I don't even know what happened because you've habituated yourself to just run down the pleasure path and to get that dopamine hit and you're so habituated by it, it's unconscious. And what happens is then your body needs more intensity and more frequency of whatever the pleasure is to then enjoy the same response. This is where you get into the addiction cycle. This is where the alcoholic's like, man, I used to have, you know, used to take a drink and now it takes a fifth. And now, now you're dying. I, I used to do drugs on the weekends and now I'm doing drugs all week. Okay, you're committing suicide. I, I used to once a month go gamble and now, now I'm gambling three, four nights a week. You're gonna ruin your life and you're gonna end up destitute, poor and broke. And so what he's talking about is this, you need to have purpose for your pleasure. You need to put your mind over your body's desires and your will's longings. Like, okay, I need to direct myself to create new pathways. So some, some of you just need to understand, here's the addiction cycle. Drugs, alcohol, sex, food, pornography, we've all got our thing, okay? So we don't judge each other. So like, I can't believe you do drugs. You're like, ah, you can't see your shoes. You've got your own issues. Okay, anyways, uh, the point is, the, the goal is, so here's, the, here's my view of equality. Offend everyone. Okay, that's my view of equality. So, so be like, I can't believe you drink alcohol. Like, I can't believe you drink gravy. You know, we've all got our thing. We've all got our thing. But whatever it is, it's that pleasure center. And so the key is, if you've got some bad habits and you've formed a neural pathway that leads to the pleasure, you've got to stop traveling on that path and you've got to forge a new path. You're like, when I get anxious, I drink. Okay, start praying. Start, I'll just tell you this, praying doesn't have nearly the side effects negative as drinking. Some of you are like, when I get stressed out, I binge eat. Okay, well, maybe worship or read the Bible or jog or do all three at the same time, okay? You're like, well, when I get tempted, I just, you know, I, I, I go off and I do things that later I regret. Okay, then, then, then create a new pathway and say, when I feel those temptations, I'm gonna tag in somebody who loves God and loves me and I'm gonna call them and say, I'm not doing good. Could you hold me accountable? Can we hang out? So I don't go make a stupid decision tonight. The Bible talks about this in terms of put off and put on. Take these pathways off and put these pathways on. What Paul is literally telling them is, you guys, your whole life, you've got these neural pathways. You just run down pleasure, 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 pleasure. You can't live for pleasure. You gotta live for purpose. And then it's taking your pleasure and making it subjugated to your purpose. Heterosexual, joyful, free, Marriage, right? That should be the goal for God's people, amen? I don't feel like you guys are even into this sermon. All right, so <laughs> is it because I'm talking about sex and it's awkward or is it just, you know, are you guys checking football scores or? I know it's not because I'm low energy, I know that. <laughs> Maybe it's my sense of humor. <laughs> or you don't, you don't have a good sense of humor. Anyways. Um, <laughs> So, so, here, so when it comes to sex, I, I, I've taught this before, but, but there are three ways that people view sex. And again, we're still in 1 Thessalonians 4, control your body, don't commit sexual immorality, don't be like the Gentiles just chasing pleasure, make sure holiness is your purpose over your pleasure. Here are three ways that people view sex. Number one, sex is God. Those are the people that for them, they are, they're like the Thessalonians, it's unhealthy. Like it's the center of your life, your identity, it controls you, you're making physical sacrifices, you're not a healthy human being, your desires are corrupt and they're getting darker and darker and darker, okay? Um, this is what's happening in our culture. This is what was happening in the ancient Roman and Greek culture. And just so you know, their lack of ability to control their pleasure led to their destruction. The greatest threat to a flourishing people is not external enemies, but internal temptations to self-destruction. 
Americans are in the process of eating and drinking and spending and sleeping themselves to destruction. The greatest enemy you have is you. The greatest enemy I have is me. We can wake up every day and say, oh my gosh, the world is out to get me. Well, but the most dangerous person to you is you. And, and if you have someone or something as your functional God, the center of your life, your highest priority, you're going to self-destruct. The counterbalance of that, sex is gross. Some people have, this is, happens in two ways. These are people that either they grew up in a very conservative, religious environment that only talked about passion and intimacy in negative terms. Some of you grew up in very religious environments. And, and what it is, it's the parents want the kids to be practicing purity, which is great until you're married and then you need passion. So the goal is purity until marriage and then passion in marriage. But I've said it before, but you know, it's this weird sort of subculture within, like sex is dirty and nasty and vile and wrong, so save it for the one you love. It's a weird message to give a middle school kid. It's a weird message to give a middle school kid. It's a great gift that you get to open on your wedding night. Right? It's like your Christmas present. Like, when are we going to open it? Christmas. Yeah. And it's a great gift. Just wait to open it. So what happens as well, some people are very religious, so they see sex as gross, and other people because they've had trauma or abuse or sexual sin or addiction. And some of you, I can just sense it in the room, you're like, things have been done to me that are devastating. And others of you like, I've done things that are devastating. Here's what I need you to know. Jesus Christ died so you could be forgiven and clean. You're not dirty, you're clean. There's no condemnation in Christ, right? That ultimately, the Bible says if, if we walk in the light, meaning we're just honest, like here's what they did and here's what I did. And we have fellowship with one another. We talk to safe, godly people about this. The blood of Jesus forgives us of all of our sins and cleanses us from all of our unrighteousness. I'm sorry for what they did. And I know a lot of you have got deep, profound trauma or abuse. Some of you, it started at a very young age. I know that some of you, you've made some very dark decisions. And you're like, now that I'm a Christian and I know Jesus, I just, if I could do all that over again, I would. Well, then I want all of us to come to this third place. Sex isn't a God and it's not gross, it's a gift. It's a gift that God gives for what? Marriage. Because again, God's not anti-sex, God is pro-marriage. Okay? And so what happens then is if it's a gift, when you're single, do you get to unwrap that gift? No, not yet. What about on your wedding night? Zero men responded to that question. <laughs> that that I, I don't understand, I don't understand. I've actually known Christian kids that grew up in fundamentalist religious environments that didn't even sleep together on their wedding night or the first year of their marriage. It's like, okay, this is a gift that God gives to be opened by a husband and a wife in their covenant of marriage. And covenant marriage is two things. It's covenant with God and consummation with your spouse. That's what marriage is. Um, let me say this. Um, Every human being has some struggle in this area, true or false. Let's just be honest. So if you're like, I don't struggle. Okay, you're probably sex is gross. That's your struggle. We've all, let's just be honest. Okay? And we've all got some brokenness in this area. We've all got some wrong thinking or some regrettable behavior or some fear and anxiety. So the best thing to do is talk to God about it. And if you're married, talk to your spouse about it. Pray it through and walk it through and get to the other side. And what I would encourage you is this, these dear people in Thessalonica, their pleasure path, their neural pathway, it was completely toward unholiness, not toward holiness. So now they got, oh, they're like, okay, this is brand new. I, I'm figuring out how to habituate myself toward obedience and holiness. True or false, if you've lived your whole life on this path and you're trying to forge this path, there are occasions where you revert back to the old path. There are. And let me just say, the key then is to close the time gap and to say, okay, I repent. 
I'm not supposed to be on this path. This path leads to death, not life. God, forgive me, Holy Spirit, fill me. Okay, help me carve out this new path. Okay. And that's the fight for holiness. And he uses the word holiness. And this is the power of the Holy Spirit. And he says, God gives you his Holy Spirit. And so what we're not saying is that the Christians are perfect. They're not. But here's what they are. They're honest and they're in the fight. They're in the fight to live in obedience to God and to take God's purpose and put it over their pleasure for a new pathway. Am I making any sense? Okay, okay this, is, this is life. Um, and so l- let me just say this. Um, I was thinking about it today. Um, hypothetically, let's just do this. Everyone on the earth just said, you know what? External authority. I'm gonna do what the word of God says when it comes just to my sexuality, not everything, just my sexuality. What would we eliminate in our culture? Just, let's just do, like, talk to me. I mean, I got nowhere else to be. Pornography gone. Most of television is gone. I mean, right now, Hollywood writers are on a strike and they're talking about closing the government. I'm like, awesome. Uh, You know, that's great. Okay, so you get rid of most of entertainment. Pedophilia, no more abuse of children. No more transgender, gender spectrum, confusion. Get rid of most of the culture wars. Burn half the garbage at Target. What else? No more bikini baristas, says a mom who obviously wants to get coffee but can't get it in her neighborhood. Okay, sorry about that, sister. Um, <laughs> You get rid of sexually transmitted diseases. You get rid of abortion. Get rid of single parent households and parents would probably have, you know, probably kids would have more dads, which means you get rid of most poverty, which means you get rid of most governmental agencies that are taking care of children that don't have fathers. Anything else? Crime, sex trafficking, Infidelity, divorce, unfaithfulness within marriage that breaks and traumatizes the family. And here's the big idea. If everybody did what the Bible said, true or false, the world would just be better. Be better. You know why they won't? Pleasure. This is what happens when you have pleasure, but not purpose that directs your pleasure. Well, don't judge me. I just want to, I just have a little campfire. (laughs) Don't judge my campfire. Well, you, you've burned down the world. And I'm sure that felt good, but not for the rest of us. Um, I'll say one more thing and then I'm gonna say a bunch of other things. Um, <laughs> let me, uh, <laughs> I just, I'm kind of in the mood. Uh, I'll be honest with you, <laughs> feeling sassy. That's how I feel, don't judge me. Okay, so um, can I speak to the young men? Okay, young men, you guys, uh, teens and 20s, young guys, they're not gonna raise their hand, they're like, nope, not gonna do it, man. I'm not coming out of the foxhole, he's loaded for bear. Okay, so so there's a book, uh, it's called uh, Men and Marriage, it's by George Gilder. It's an interesting book. Uh, Pastor Douglas Wilson, who I've known for a long time, he just republished it, sent me a copy. So I was reading it again. And uh, the subtitle, here's the book, Men in Marriage. Here's the subtitle. Civilization is built by men with families to feed. Let me talk to the young men. God made young men strong, physically strong, testosterone flowing, wanting to conquer, to lead, right? To accomplish and to do things. He says that young men are barbarians. True or false? They're barbarians. They're like, unless somebody works on them, like they're just, they're going to just burn the world down while they smoke cigarettes. I mean, that's just what they're gonna do. And so what God gives, God gives this testosterone and this strength and this masculine energy and this drive to young men. And our culture knows nothing of what to do with it. So we give, here's the two options we give guys. You could be a drag queen or join a drug cartel. Those are your options. Drag queen or drug cartel. 
We got a whole generation looking at young men. Like, oh my gosh, they're, they're very active. We should medicate them so that they act like girls. And then we should castrate them and tell them that they are girls. Or, or we should make them live with their mother as long as possible so that they don't activate any of that masculine energy. We can subdue them. Let's just self-medicate them with entertainment and screens and vaping and drugs and legalized weed and watching porn and enjoying video games and just taking their strongest years and just being a gutted, neutered, worthless meat sack. That's how I'm feeling. So, so some guys, this is potentially going somewhere. Some guys, so how many guys are like, I don't like that. So those guys, they, they watch Andrew Tate, they listen to Joe Rogan. People have masculinity, but not the spirit of God. So they're not like Jesus and they don't understand true masculinity. And they think, well, then, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm gonna have a body count. I'm gonna go out and take you know, advantage of women. And I'm gonna go just take advantage of people in business, maybe commit crimes. These are the guys that run gangs. They run drug cartels. They're bullies. They're thugs. They're jerks. They're intimidating. They're domineering and they're overbearing. And what Gilder says is, well, what we need to do, we need to take all the strength of the barbarians and we need to direct it. You want to win? You want to fight? Start a business. Start a business. Go generate some revenue. You, you like pleasure. You want to be intimate. Get married to a girl. Thank you very much. Okay, direct all that. Now what you're gonna find is, if you act like a barbarian, she's not gonna sleep with you. So this becomes a course correction for a young man. He shows up, he's like, Rawr. she's like, no. He's like, Ugh. so that's how it works, okay? You gotta bring flowers and say, I'm sorry, and put the lid down. <laughs> barbarian doesn't like that. <laughs> but it civilizes him in a good way, right? He's like flowers, the toilet paper goes this way, not this way, <laughs> lid down, right? <laughs> Neanderthal man, make note, okay? He works on it. So he directs all his energy, because the Bible says, hey, if you got all that energy, it's gotta just go one place, marriage. Like, okay, true or false, before she marries you, she wants to know that you have a job. Yeah, she does. She does. Right? She's like, do you have a job? He's like, why? Because I don't like to be homeless with a barbarian. That's why. Okay? So now the guy's like, okay, I got to make money. I, I got to pursue a woman. I got to get married. And then he enjoys the woman. Next thing you know, <gasps> there's more people. <laughs> She's like, oh, guess what? He's like, ah. I gotta make more money, okay? So what it does then, it kicks into a man this protective instinct, like I need to protect my wife and my kids and I need to provide for them and I'm going to be a barbarian for them, but not with them. I'm gonna go to war and make money. I'm gonna protect my wife. I'm gonna love my kids and I'm gonna take all my testosterone and my masculine energy and my aggression and my intention and boom, I'm gonna go make money. I'm gonna love my wife. I'm gonna raise my kids. And if anybody tries to castrate my kids or commit adultery with my wife, barbarian time. That's where we're gonna find ourselves. Okay? So, I didn't mean to say all of that. It's just what I'm feeling. And so let me just say this. So what it does, it, here's what the Bible says is all that strength and all that passion and all that energy, just direct it with a purpose. With a purpose. With a purpose. And if, and if you don't do that, and all you do is just let a whole generation of young men, well, here's porn and here's women that'll sleep with you and here's stupid shows like uh, The Bachelor and, you know, and then, and, and here's, you know, happy hour at old, time, at, at old Town and, you know, and here's just the body count. You know what you get? The complete destruction of an entire civilization. The subtitle again of the book, Civilization is Built by Men with Families to Feed. 
If you don't have a wife and you don't have children and you have passion without purpose, you are going to be a problem. And if you have purpose, you're going to be a patriarch. So men can either be a problem or a patriarch. Those are the options. I, I'm very sick of our culture just taking that word. Oh, that's patriarchal. Praise God, we need a few more strong men that love women and children. You know what a patriarch is? It's a heterosexual guy that gets married and feeds his kids. And the government's like, that's bad because you're the freaking government, that's why. And we believe in God, not government. So we want men to direct all of their passion and strength to bless women and children. That's what a patriarch does. All right. <sighs> Here's my second point, quickly. Uh, no, this is my second point. I have two points. That was the first one. <laughs> If you're new, you're like, does this happen every week? Yeah, don't Google me. Okay, um, so uh, six ways to live on purpose. Here's what we're gonna talk about. And then, uh, and then we'll sing and you'll love that. Okay, First Thessalonians 4, 9 through 12. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another for that indeed is what you're all doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia, their region. But we urge you brothers, they're, they're like family to do this more and more and aspire to live a quiet life, to mind your own affairs, um, to work with your hands as we instructed you so you may walk properly before outsiders. Here's a crazy line. To be dependent on no one. You're like, I like socialism. <laughs> dependent on no one. Amen. You, you can't be free if you're dependent. You can only be free if you're independent. So here's what he's saying. He's saying to live your life on purpose, you've got to get your, first thing, you've got to get your pleasure under control. Your purpose needs to drive you and then it needs to direct your pleasures. But what he's saying then is be purposeful relationally. Love one another. This is in the church, not the world. Okay? Find your Christian friends. Find your brothers for the battle. And I just want to honor, I want to honor the men in this church. The greatest men in the world are in this church. I'm just telling you that. For the size church we have, we have the biggest men's ministry I've ever seen in any church anywhere ever. You see two nights, rooms of men, two rooms, because we don't fit in one room, men walking in, they're like, hey, would you please yell at me so I could sing to Jesus and pray with my brothers? That's great. That's great. I had, a, I had a pastor drive by recently on a weekend. He's like, it's, it looks like you pastor a lifted truck's parking lot. <laughs> I do. They all got beards and tattoos and they're open carry. These, 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 these are the Bible believing barbarians. That's what they are. And here's what they do. This is what I love about our guys. They're like, love you, bro. Love you too. They're, they're, they're like, this is not the Elton John hour. Like these are, these are, these are the dudes. Okay. We love each other as brothers. We pray for each other. We worship Jesus together. We build up men to bless women and children. What he's saying is the world is gone. Don't let the church follow the world. He says, in addition to relationally, mentally, live quietly. Don't get involved in everybody's business and don't get sucked into all the drama. Just turn your phone off, go home, hug your wife, play with your kids, you know, cook some meat, uh, you know. <laughs> Uh, emotionally, he says, mind your own affairs. Oh, did you hear who uh, uh, the Kardashians are dating? Who freaking cares? These are, these are, I mean, who cares? Pray for them. They think that underwear is outerwear. I, I don't, you know, just pray for them. Don't worry about social media and following people and what they're saying. Physically, he says, work with your hands. Hey, you know what? Repair your fence, change your oil, vacuum your house, right? Like whatever, you know, take a shower, use soap. I mean, just 
find something to do that's, that's create. We live in this day where we're like, I'm going to pay someone to cook food and bring it to my house. You know what? You're fat. You should, you should go to the store and then you should come home and cook and then you should run, okay? Do something with your body. Spiritually, walk properly before outsiders, meaning the non-Christians are watching, so just live your life. Like, I love Jesus, I believe the Bible, I'm heterosexual, I got married, we got kids, we're gonna make more, you know, and uh, I work a job, and I hate the government, and I love Jesus. That's just where I'm at, you know, and that's where I'm at. And if you would like to come to church with me, he'll yell at you for an hour, and, and it's free, okay? And then financially, he says, be dependent on no one. No one, because the borrower, the Bible says, slave to the lender. The average American has $22,000 in debt, mainly credit cards. Interest rates are killing them. The government has a trillion dollars of debt. That's $100,000 for every man, woman, and child. At some point, you can't just spend money you don't have. And at some point, you just need to live within your means and you need to save a little bit and tithe to God and be dependent on no one. And, and, and for those of you who are socialists, you're idiots. You are complete and total idiots. Because you believe this stupid myth like, I don't wanna do things, but I would like to have things. So I will vote for someone that will take it from other people. That's called stealing and eventually you steal until there's nothing left to steal. Okay, we'll bring the band up. This is gonna be awesome. <laughs> Here's what he's saying is, get your pleasure under control, starting with your sexuality, and then live your life on purpose. Physically, mentally, spiritually, relationally, emotionally, sexually, saying, you know what, I'm gonna listen to God and facts, not government or feelings, and I'm going to live my life with purpose. Let me just share a story. Hang in there, okay? We're almost done. We're gonna sing, because we're God's people. We wanna worship. We wanna enjoy Jesus. We wanna listen to what God has to say with us. But let me just tell you this week, here was my week. So here's what I did. I wanted to practice First Thessalonians. I'll tell you what I did. I turned my phone off. Okay, let me tell you this. Your phone has an off button. You should pray about using it. What I did then, I, I spent some time leaf blowing. It was wonderful. I don't know why, but leaf blowing, it's just so, it is so wonderful to get something done so quickly. It's, and then leveled up, pressure washed. Ooh. I just tell him like, oh! I would pressure wash as a free job. I love it that much. I just love it. And then I put bird seed out because I wanted to see if some birds would come and visit, and they did. So I sat down and I read a book that I've been wanting to read for a very long time. So I sat there, no leaves, and clean environment with birds reading a book in the sunshine, breathing fresh air, not through a mask. It was wonderful. And one night I grilled a steak and I nailed it. I can't cook anything, but my spiritual gift is grilling. And I ate the steak to the glory of God and the joy of all people. Um, and I drove my Bronco up into the mountains and I took it off roading and I figured out what all the buttons were for and I broke the windshield. <laughs> I did. And then I went for a long hike and I prayed to Jesus and I sang in the woods and there were a bunch of baby deer running all over the place. And they weren't scared of me. They just looked at me like I'm odd. They, they look like you. <laughs> and, and I slept 10 hours and I woke up and I took a nap. <laughs> Cause I'm a Christian. All right, Lord, we're gonna come worship now and have fun. God, thanks for what may have been a sermon and the ability to have a, God, we just, we just say that the world is not that fun, but we want the church to be fun. And that the world is living for pleasure and all they have is pain and misery. We wanna live on purpose so that we can have joy and we can have freedom. 
God, we want to have sexual freedom, financial freedom, emotional freedom, physical freedom. God, we live in a nation built on freedom and nobody's free because they don't know Jesus. But we believe if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. So Jesus, I pray for a release of the Holy Spirit to encourage these people to walk in the freedom and joy that you have for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey.